Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's see here. Uh, thanks to Kathy uh, and Jill uh, for inviting me when they did. I told them there were better people to do this, but they picked me anyway. So um, I am a rural sociologist. There aren't very many of us. And um, there used to be more, but the departments are disappearing. And lots of us study the agri-food system, and organics is a central dimension of that study. Uh, when I was 30 years old, uh, my two organic growers were Rainbow, Ricky, and Terry. Ricky was a deep ecologist. Terry was more of a green entrepreneur. And one was certified, one was not. Um, lots of my tribe got its meat from the Amish out of the trunk of a black Cadillac middled by two old hippies. I gardened and canned, and the food co-op was the hub of the infant local food system. And I imagine lots of you have similar kinds of stories. The food co-op and the community radio station was also the hub of social movement activity. I'm going to be talking about that today. The peace movement, the local food movement, the anti-nuclear movement. Uh, it wasn't until much later that I understood how my individual life fit into that history. I had to wait to become a sociologist. I was linked to several producers in both direct and indirect commodity chains. Indirect, indirect commodity chains. Direct with Ricky and Terry and one person removed with the Amish. And then indirect uh, for my bulk grains, for my granola at the food co-op, and for my large bottles of Knudsen's organic juice, very large bottles. Commodity chains, commodity systems analysis is a valuable concept to help us understand our relationship with the agri-food system, and I will return to that later. During those days, I was working with a, as an RA for Bill Hefferman. I was in grad school, studying the impacts of the conventional ag system, especially poultry, especially poultry. And other rural sociologists were looking at organics. I was mostly studying the problem, and other rural sociologists were looking at the solution. And slowly, I moved that way. Okay, let's see. I want to talk about the movement. In the 1970s, EPA regulated chemical use in ag for the first time. The lease and sale programs were grounded in an organic philosophy, but employed the term sustainable agriculture to be more politically palatable. Organics was the third piece of the environmental movement successful counter to the negative ec ecological externalities of the modern food system. After a long battle, the NOP created the label, which I will refer to as the brand, Again, a compromise. And conventional agriculture contested the movement on all fronts. The history is fascinating sociologically, and you could spend a long time just reading that. Okay. Organics has come a long way, and many of you have been on the bus the whole time. The NOP was a great victory for the planet and its inhabitants. As I tell my friends about organics, uh, eaters, producers, flora, fauna, all of us are much better off without so much contact with poisons. I'm honored to be here with you today. Now I apologize because I have to do some sociological theory now. I had to honor you first and then. The philosophy. We'll start with German green politician and sociologist Erwin Beck and his term reflexive modernization. It goes like this. Upon reflection, we realize that corporate chemical intensive monoculture is hazardous to our health. And at many systems level of risk, it is hazardous. Biological, hydrological, climatological, agro agronomic, uh, cultural, at many levels of risk, it is hazardous to our health. We accepted science and technology without question. It was a mistake we made, but can fix it through better use of science, through reflection, and better use of science and appropriate technologies. Maybe solar power is really a better idea than nuclear power, after all. BH free, free bottles, which I'll need to drink from in a minute, instead of disposable BHP free personal bottles instead of disposable plastic bottles, and natural childbirth instead of C-sections. Maybe these are better ideas after all. Getting closer to agriculture, the philosopher Paul Thompson at Michigan State divides these worldviews, these philosophies, into two general areas, industrial and agrarian. For the industrial view, agriculture is just another part of the industrial system where commodities are produced at the lowest price possible, lowest cost possible. The trend toward consolidation in farms and firms is just economies of scale at work, the lower cost. The system needs to be exported to other 
uh, to the rest of the world to ensure commodities, uh, to ensure sustainable food production for the world. Landscapes are viewed in terms of commodities that can produce, and while there are some concerns about labor and community and environment and animal welfare, these external externalities can be addressed without major changes to the system. Uh, from this perspective, sustainable equals produce more with less. From an agrarian perspective, some kind is called alternative or multifunctional. Agriculture has an important social function. We heard about this yesterday. Beyond its efficient production of commodities, such as providing positive ecological services and protecting the integrity and functioning of the ecosystem. Ag should be embodied in local community and consolidation and concentration negatively impact the sustainability of local community quality of life. This view includes arguments of fair trade, fair labor, animal welfare, and notes that a major departure from the con ag, conventional agriculture model is needed because that model is ex extractive it's mining and unsustainable. I come to you today through my work from Southern Sayre, thank you very much, uh, where by law, by law, right, we employ a tripartite definition of sustainability. Environmental, economic, and social aspects. Organics is a major part of the ecological base of sustainable agriculture. Now, excuse me for being naive, but I think conceptually sustainability is pretty simple. It's the ability of a system and its subsystems to continue to perform their functions indefinitely. It's very simple, conceptually. Okay? Sustainability is a function of resilience. Resilience is the ability of a system to bounce back or return to approximate equilibrium after a severe shock, and I mean sooner than later. Okay? And resilience is a function of diversity. And diversity is defined as several different types of organic and organizational forms occupying a biogeographic cultural space. Now, conventional agriculture violates the ecological law of diversity with its focus on monoculture. It's really, as does conventional agriculture violate laws of economics as we trend away from competition toward monopoly. But history is what's real. History is what's real, not theory. We're doing theory. Now, history is what's real. And as you know, it is not easy to agree on the meaning of the word sustainable. In fact, the word sustainable, quote, is in play right now, right? It is in play. Similar to organics not long ago, Walmart, Leonardo Academy, the Keystone Initiative, and more are various standards, metrics, efforts to capture the word sustainable. I think the Leonardo Academy Initiative is the most democratic and transparent of these efforts. It will be interesting to see how organics and GMOs are included in these efforts or not. And it's in play right now. The brand. I should have got one of the little um, tote bags and just hang, hung, hung it right here. But here is the brand. Uh, I went to my cupboard. And these pictures are from my, my cupboard. So some of them are, are not too good because I'm not good at this. The USDA label, uh, USDA label the brand is a great victory and it's a great brand. It is the institutionalized embodiment of the success of the social movement. The at first maligned and marginalized critique of reductionist science and industrial agriculture overcame obstacles and secured legitimacy in the form of organic standards and established an ecological base for sustainable agriculture. Organics has grown beyond the niche and it is now moving with force into the mainstream. The label is everywhere. Here's some more. Here's my cupboard sitting on my printer. On the left is Safeway Randall's, and on the right is my HEB Central Market. Here is my half and half. Here is my morning fix. Right? Is this close to your morning fix? And uh, just to show that my coffee also is fair trade and certified kosher. So I didn't know that until I really started digging into the brands, but you know the brands are blowing up out there now, right? In my terms of my son, it's blowing up. We have brands and labels everywhere. Now the label is everywhere, but the success is problematic. And now to the rest of the story in Paul Harvey's words. Conventionalization and, bi uh, conventionalization and bifurcation. This is from Julie Guthman's book, Agrarian Dreams, The Paradox of Organic Farming and Cow. She is really the expert on these topics, and uh, I am, as all of us, Academics do, we are using other people to make our points. Conventionalization refers to the general trend in organics to take on many of the characteristics of mainstream ag. Economies of scale, consolidation, and formalization of labor, competitive advantage using Porter's notion instead of comparative, but 
global sourcing, and in doing so, it tends to become less sustainable. It becomes eco-input substitution farming, farming to the list and linked to global value chains. Economics tells us that as the premium attracts, inter the premium attracts entry, entry increases competition, which will then shrink the premium. As business laws start to dictate success, you end up with organic global value chains, not that dissimilar from conventional global value chains. One notable example in the production systems level is importing Chilean nitrate for winter Cali vegetables is not sustainable. It's not. Or uh, importing organic strawberries from China beyond the possible gaming of the USDA label is not sustainable. Uh, nor is relying on undocumented labor uh, to s produce organic foods sustainable. Sociologically, this is problematic is the sociology. Quality of life for farmers and rural people is a function of the kinds of commodities or value chains they are linked to. The quality of life for rural peoples is a function of, depends on the kinds of value chains they are linked to. Now I'm going to Lily. Hi, Lily. Lily is going to help because really I want to show some visual representations of conventionalization, and Phil Howard's work is, he's at Michigan State, is the best work uh, to do this with. So let's scroll down a little. I know it's a long ways away. Let's just kind of scroll down and bring that one up in the middle. Um, 2009, organic industry structure acquisitions by the top 30 firms. Let me see if my pointer works. Here's Haynes Celestial. There's my peanut butter. We're going to get to it in just a minute here. There's my peanut butter. I found it on there. But what I want you to see here, and without digging into it very deep, but the major firms have been active. This is, uh, th this is conventionalization, as the major firms buy up many of the uh, profitable organic firms. Let's go to the next one. A little bit bigger here. Organic industry structure in January 2008. These are introductions, not acquisitions, but introductions. We have beer, there's Unilever, Pepsi, Kellogg, ConAgra, M&M, Mars. Next one. I know there's a lot of information here, but I, I, I've got to keep moving. Okay? We have a long way to go in a short time to get there. January 2008, once again, significant acquisitions and introductions. There's Danone and Danon and... Smithfield and Brown Cow. Next one. We'll skip that one. Next one. Let's go to the bottom and then come back to the animation, Lily. Okay? Here's Sam's Club and Walmart. We'll end up there. And here's Wild Oats and Whole Foods. Remember some of the controversy over that acquisition, right? And once again, here's Safeway. There's my, there, there's my, uh, there, that's H-E-B. That's my half and half. And that, and uh, that's okay. let's go to the animation now. Let's back up. Okay. This is Phil Howard's work, animation of the changing networks in organics over time. And what you see here is where we used to have a whole lot of independent firms. Very rapidly, what we have is an increasing consolidated system, much like the conventional agriculture system. Phil Howard's work is incredible. His visual sociology is incredible to help us see the picture. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, Lily. And there's my, I'm, I'm not very good at, I need lots of technical help. I forgot to acknowledge my, uh, uh, Dr. Choi um, is one of my co-authors and Mr. Lara, I forgot to acknowledge him. Anymore. But here we have Haynes Celestial. If you've been along for this whole trip, you remember a long time ago that uh, we were buying from this brand years ago, and now they are one of the major brands. The NOP brand is a market label with no claims to superiority, at least the original brand was, to conventional systems, a result of the compromise, the lack of other forms of government support for organics, like economic support for transition or research, is seen as hindering the adoption of organics, hence the new monies and programs in 2008. I think it's Kathy's 2009 article, right? 2009. 
that I used to make that point. It's not me making that point. It's other people making that point. In the lead up to those monies, I conducted some research in Texas on farmers and ranchers' perceptions of organics, and using a representative sample of uh, a representative stratified sample of major crops. In Texas, we identified what we call pragmatic conventional producers. These are conventional producers that show an interest in organics. These are the ones that if we would want to adopt, these are the ones that are likely to adopt. I have some information on them, so we'll look at some slides. There's my uh, Dr. Choi, my co-author, and this is in the uh, journal Sustainability in 2010. Um, we do not have much time, and I apologize, so I will go fast here. But I just want you to see these are some of the uh, years of farming. There's a notice. The, this is the only place you'll see the ends, but we have about 450 conventional. They showed no interest in organics. We have 334. They showed from slight to a lot of interest in organics. And then we had 100 people who self-labeled themselves as organic producers. So this is what they look like the conventionals that might adopt as we try and diffuse the innovation. They fall pretty well on years of farming uh, uh, between the two other groups. Let me go to this one. Notice that they are lowest here, but load here pretty well. Notice that of the groups, they are the ones most likely to be interested in expanding. Okay, expanding. They are the least satisfied with their operation. And yes, more money would help me get in. This is not news, but this is just data to support what I think you already have ideas about. They support the philosophy. They load much closer to, our, to the organics on this one than the conventionals. They're concerned about the risk of transitioning. They are not so sure that it's technically viable, and they are even less sure that it's financially viable. I believe this is work, work for the USDA to be doing. My lenders support the idea. Everybody should laugh now. One, three, well, the organics are a bit, but not so sure. They have the information. Once again, not so sure. And I know you can't see the bottom one there very well. Can you see it? Look at the bottom line across there, even for the organic folks. I understand the process of organic certification. Even half of the people who say they're organic are not so sure about it. And, and actually, 80% uh, disagree or are not sure about it. So there is some work to be done there based on the data. This is a representative stratified sample by commodities. And we're breaking it out by commodities now. OK. OK. Now to bifurcation. Back to Julie Guthman. Bifurcation uh, means the splitting of the original deep ecology grounded organic movement and producers into a conventional wing of larger operations that have converted called organic light. It's what Julie calls it. That farm to the minimum regs of the NOP and obtain the brand and premium and sell in indirect markets. And then there's the traditional wing or deep organic that farms beyond the regs agroecologically and sells on trust and direct markets. Now again, this is theory this, uh, and not history, but the archetypes, these are archetypes, are useful. Okay, It's useful. And here are a few slides from my research. Bifurcation, years of farming. We, we would expect the, the conventionals to be in not as long, but certified, I'm sorry, the cert, uh, okay. we would expect the non-certifieds to have been in longer because they will be the deep, the deep ecos, and that did not hold up on this slide. Okay. Certifieds have been in longer. This is a, a few years earlier, so some of the conventionalization process I don't think has kicked in yet. Years organic farming, the certifieds have been in longer here than the non-certifieds. This is uh, self-identified based on the survey. And no, this is a convenient sample with very low ends, right? You see it up there. It's a convenient sample with very low ends. Future plans, uh, certified and non-certified. The non-certified are more likely to be expanding, although both groups are looking to expand. As you might expect, the certified uh, tend to more likely be full-time farmers, and the non-certified less likely. As expected, 
the non-certified are more likely to participate in direct markets versus the certified? The opposite for indirect markets? Reasons for farming? Both of them, although it's statistically different between the two, certified are more likely to present uh, economic reasons. And there's no difference between the two groups on the ideological and environmental reasons. They both rate them very high. These are Likert scale items 1 to 5. They both rate them very high. Since the uh, adoption of the NOP program, organic certification is simpler and easier. They don't think so. Just put that. Three is the middle value. Three is the middle value. Uh, organic certification helps me get a better price. They do tend to agree with that, and especially the certified folks. Organic certification is needed for small-scale direct sales. Certified say, no, uh, uh, they disagree. Is not needed, I'm sorry, is not needed, and they disagree with that. Certified folks want the non-certified to be certified. They tend to. Non-certified tend to agree, and my customers expect me to be certified, and a huge difference between those two groups. And finally, I am certified because most of my product is sold to indirect markets. Not all of them answered this because now we've got our two groups here. And um, certified agreed with that. I'm, I am certified because I have to be. They agree with that even more. And I am certified. I'm not certified because my operation is too small, and they, the non-certs tend to and this is from a this is from the special volume that was invoked. This is from the special volume. Um, the bifurcation part of this title shouldn't be there, but now it's really time to talk about value chains. Um, uh, in the sociology of agri-food, value chains, commodity chains, supply chains, uh, we use different terms for them, are a central dimension of the discussion. We talk about global value change, local regional value change, and fair trade value change. And the best work on fair trade is done by uh, Laura Reynolds and, and, and her people at uh, Colorado State. Global value chains are based on global sourcing. We search the planet for the best factors of production, and we link them together, and we bring the grapes to my table from Chile so I can have them all the time. And they tend to be retailer driven. Walmart is a good example that announced in 2006. They're going to increase organic sales of foods, and they plan to sell organics at 10% above conventional prices. If you want to dig into Walmart, this is like a, less ap academic and more popular, but Charles Fishman's book, The Walmart Effect, is a good example. Here is some mixed greens from the Walmart that one of my grad students brought in as I was talking to him about this, once again. And here are some global value chains. There are my Dole organic bananas that I take into the students. And if you look on them, there's a, you know, there's a website you can go to, right? And here is my wholesome sweetener organic molasses. Uh, I was really excited about that. And I see we have some wholesome sweetener fair trade organic sugar downstairs too. But if I flip that organic uh, molasses over, it's fair trade and it's USDA. And at first it said it was from Texas, and then I found it was from Paraguay. And I was not so happy about that part. I thought I was really excited about it being from Texas. It didn't work, which is OK. Retailer-driven value chains. This is Safeway on the left and, and Randall's, and this is uh, Central Market. This is a discussion, folks. The retailers are driving the value chains. You look at the value chain, and you look for the powerful players in the value chain, and who drives it? Is it a producer-driven value chain? Is it a buyer-driven value chain? Increasingly, the discussion is about consolidation in the retail industry, and the retailers are driving the chains. They are extracting most of the profit out of the chain. Fair trade value chains. Um, another social movement with some economic and social dimensions of sustainability built on cooperative philosophy, remove the corporate middleman, transparent open books, that percent value in equals percent profit out. Local value chains. These are not my pictures. These are pulled from the stair side, I think. I got the one on the right. I thought that was appropriate, but I don't. I'm not one of the picture takers, so I don't, I don't have pictures to blow. Direct sales based on trust tend to be smaller scale, some organic, non-certified, more local, embedded in community, often includes ecological, economic, and social dimensions of sustainability. And one of the hot topics, regional fair trade value chains, ag in the middle. Megan deserves more. These are these guys, these guys and gals. A social dimension is the bias on guys and farmers, right? 
the social dimension is the bias. Of it. But uh, they're, they're too big for direct markets and they're too small for the commodity markets. What are we going to do with them? And really, this was sort of like my grandfather, and if we could keep them on the land, this would be a very good thing. And if the children wanted to stay on the land, that would be a very good thing. Here are some examples. And Tom Lyson's work with Stevenson and Rick Welsh on food in the mid-level farm, renewing an ag at the middle is the latest and best piece on that. Okay, now for some more sociology now. All of these trends are embedded in the larger discussion of the globalization of economy and society and the role of science, the state, corporations, and social movements in global society. From a regime's perspective, we're in a transition phase now. From the nation state as the unit of analysis to the world and the globalization as the unit of analysis. And the new order, the new normal is in play right now. We are in a transition phase. As powerful forces jockey globally to bring about their preferences. The WTO, IMF, World Bank, NAFTA, EMU, these are the new mechanisms of governance. Governments don't organize the global food system. Increasingly, systems of governance do outside the democratic system. Organics fits well with Harriet Friedman's corporate environmental regime. At various levels, countries and companies all over the world are mobilizing to enter the organics market and capture the green premium. In many cases, the nascent organic industries receive state support. Transition, research, market dollars, parts of the developing world are being bought. Land is being bought and organized for uh, export and organic export to the south is being organized to feed the north. Okay? The industry is in transition and conventionalization is progressing. The premiums will shrink with increased consolidation at the production and sales level, any inefficient actors will leave the market. Smith and Marsden's work in England is already starting to indicate this. The global competitive advantage for organics will emerge as the market matures, and then, so what is our global competitive advantage in organics? What is it? Which crops? And where are we on the adoption ladder? Regional, nationally, and globally. The NRC report. Uh, we're at a pivotal time, pivotal time in global ag. Indeed, how are we going to feed the world? And back to uh, back to Thompson, there are two different views on how we're going to feed the world. Okay, it's in play. Incremental change. We've done pretty good with this to extend the diffusion of appropriate agroecological techniques to enhance sustainability of all farms, organics, and cover crops, and no-till and IPM, and they. They all fit in here. We've had much more success here because it's politically less controversial. And Patricia Allen's book, 2005 book, I should have it up here, Together at the Table, Sustainability and Sustenance in the American Ag Food System is a very good book to discuss this. I have a long reading list for you. Transformative change, though, we've not done so well. It's much more controversial. We've got to talk about labor. We've got to talk about government policy like commodity subsidies. How are you going to bust that thing open? It's a broader systems perspective that contexts agroeco dimensions within larger political, social, economic dimensions to better understand opportunities and constraints of different views and paths to sustainability. We need to realize that markets and market actors like large corporations and government policy are integral drivers of change. How much money is there in the budget now to, to, to fund transformative change in American agriculture? All back, Eric Beck, we need deeper reflection and significant change. Deeper reflection. Okay. How much time? I'm, I'm right on track. It'll be less than five. Good. Okay. The four questions. Oh, there's me. The emancipatory question, the next step in the agriculture and food and agriculture and human values in 08. Uh, there are four questions. The environmental question is simple. What is the relationship between the modern ag system and the quality of the environment? It's simple, right? And you all mostly know the answer to that, right? The agrarian question. What is the relationship between the modern ag system and the structure and quality of life for farmers and their communities? That's the agrarian question. Some of you know the answer. And now we're more into the social dimensions and economic dimensions. The third one is the food question. What's the relationship between the modern ag system and the quality of the food we eat? Okay, that's called the quality turn. And actually, organics is here too. 
Organics is mostly in the environmental question and the food question, a little bit in the agriculture. And the last one is the emancipatory question, okay? How are we going to make sure that poor people and old people and all, everybody gets to eat good food? How are we going to make sure that the workers are treated fairly on the processing line and on the farm? And that the farmer can make a living? No, oh, wait, no, I don't want to go there yet. The environmental dimension of modern ag was the first to reach critical mass and generate a movement critical of reduction in science and chemical monoculture ending with the legislation. Actually, the SCS and then NRCS starts it, I think, a long time ago. But then EPA and SER and NOP. Organics is the most far-reaching. The brand reaches beyond national borders, right? To sell in this market, you have to meet the regs of the brand. Okay, global value chains. And it gatekeeps this huge U.S. market, but it also drives the global conventionalization of organics. With conventionalization, the trend in organics is toward less sustainability. I'm reminded of the great rural sociologist Fred Buttle who warned us of the uncanny ability of conventional agriculture to sustain the unsustainable. Good line, right? Fred. Fred was incredible. Much more work needs to be done on all four of the questions along the lines of transformative change. Remembering most of the social and economic dimensions of early organics did not survive the NOP compromise. Now, social dimensions, fair wages, fear-free workplace, danger-free workplace, humane animal treatment, documented workers, competitive markets, communities that build social capital, full co I mean, there's a long list here, and I don't have, but here was the list that I wanted to add after yesterday. Okay? Uh, social dimensions. Um, this conference is an excellent example. It would not have happened probably 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Everybody that tried to organize it would have been fired. So that's a huge social dimension right there. That's a huge change. Institutional resistance in USDA and the chemical industry and the land-grant universities and why research is not done there and why teaching of sustainable ag is not done there and, 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 and why SARE has not been funded to the level that would allow us to uh, engage the education part of sustainable agriculture and all the social dimensions. Research barriers, tenure journals, the land grants and their institutional silos and young professors being taught if you're going to get tenure, what should you do? Multidisciplinary, anti, uh, sustainable ag, no, 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 tenure. Ten, you got to get tenure for six years to do this. Why I'm at SHSU? Why am I at Sam Houston State instead of a land grant? Okay, can I, can I, I've got tenure talking like this at most land grants, not the one I came out of. People were being denied tenure for talking like this when I was at Red Sam and the zoo. Not all land grants are the same, thank goodness, thank goodness. Access to the land, barriers to integrate livestock, the whole coexistence. This is my list now. I don't have time to go down through my whole list. Though. Correct. <laughs> and now I am to my last slide. No, that's right. I don't. We could, we could just talk about this all, the, all, but to my last slide. The model. From a rural social perspective, Tom Lyson's work. Tom Lyson's work at Cornell on civic ag is a good place to start. Rebuild and relink community. Food from somewhere as opposed to food from nowhere. Food from somewhere instead of food from nowhere. Our Southern Sarah Community Innovation Grants in collaboration with the Southern Rural Development Center support this model. Charlie and Emily Jackson's Appalachia Sustainable Ag Project is a great example of this model in action. And it is one of Sarah's first two funded large systems projects. When we get the money, we'll fund it. Uh, regional fair trade chains are also, and Ag in the Middle is also. To conclude, last paragraph. Organics provides an interesting case for looking at systems and the ecological, social, and economic dimensions. It reveals notable successes and future challenges. New labels, standards, metrics are exploding as part of the beyond organics pushed by the movement and the agri-food industry. Governance seems to be replacing government as the regulating function. Look at Fair Trade or the Marine Stewardship Council. It's not government. Through persistence, the sustainable ag movement has secured policies and programs, and it needs to be ready to intervene in the process again as the opportunity presents itself. The next battle looks to be about GMOs again. And Food Inc. really scared me, by the way. 
Thanks for the opportunity to be with you here today, and I look forward to our conversations and the rest of the conference.